Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I believe we are ready to begin. Could I kindly request you to rise to your feet as you welcome the presidential party? Welcome, welcome one and all to this, the annual memorial, Ray Vijay Vardhana Lecture. As is tradition, it's interesting that today we will be hearing about technology, but technology seems to be failing us right at the beginning of this lecture, but I'm sure it will change as we proceed. Ladies and gentlemen, as is traditional, we will commence this evening's proceedings with the traditional lighting of the oil lamp. The lighting of the oil lamp symbolizes the dispelling of darkness. And what more is this, the Ray Vijayawadana Memorial Lecture, other than the dispelling of the darkness of ignorance, if I may say so. May I call upon, first and foremost, the President of the Institution of Engineers of Sri Lanka, Engineer Professor Jayavilal Migoda. May I also call upon past presidents, two past presidents of the Institution of Engineers, Engineer Professor Sam Karna Ratna, and of course, Engineer Professor L.L. Ratnaika, two past presidents of the Institution of Engineers. Kind sirs, if you could kindly proceed to the lamp and commence the lighting of the oil lamp. Thank you. May I also call upon, on behalf of the family of the late Ray Vijayawardena, Rehan Mudanayaka, to kindly come forward as well. May I also call upon the chairman of the Charitable Trust, the Ray Vijayawardena Charitable Trust, Professor Malik Ranasinghe. We would be honored if the chairman of the agricultural and plantation ESC of the Institution of Engineers, Engineer TMR Disanayaka also comes forward please to do the honors and he will be followed by the acting CEO and executive secretary of the Institution of Engineers of Sri Lanka, Engineer Neil Abe Sekara. And of course last but definitely not least, the speaker whom we are all waiting to hear from, Dr. Sanjeeva Veeravarna. Sir, if you could kindly step forward as well. Today we will be hearing from Dr. Veeravarna about how Sri Lanka can be taken from nobody to leader, achieving global leadership with software. Ladies and gentlemen, today we commemorate the life of Deshamanya Vidya Jyoti, Dr. Philip Revatha Vidyavadana. He was an engineer, an aviator, an inventor, and an Olympian. And I don't think I have even touched most of what he has achieved by even those labels, if I may call it that. If there is something that we can celebrate, it's that Professor Dr. Revata Vijayawardena broke boundaries. And that is what the Charitable Trust, the Ray Vijayawardena Charitable Trust, seeks to achieve. It is to break boundaries, it is to carry on his legacy, it is to equip young people to take on the mantle that he left behind and to bring Sri Lanka pride and recognition on a global platform. Thank you. Let me thank all the gentlemen who so kindly obliged us by lighting the, tra the traditional lighting of the oil lamp. And now, we will have the garlanding of the photograph of late engineer Dr. Ray Vijayawardena and I 
would like to call upon the President of the Institution of Engineers of Sri Lanka, Engineer Jaivilal Migoda, to kindly step forward for this momentous occasion. Thank you. That was the President of the Institution of Engineers of Sri Lanka, Engineer Jabilal Milgoda. Thank you, sir. You may all take your seats. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. May I now call upon the President of the Institution of Engineers, Mr. Engineer Jabilal Milgoda, to kindly come forward for the welcome address. A warm round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev Virwar Varga, our speaker today. Past presidents, council members, members of the Revijay Vardhana Charitable Trust, Trust, and uh, all distinguished invitees, ladies and gentlemen. The Institution of Engineers Sri Lanka, being the apex professional body for engineers in Sri Lanka, and committed towards uplifting the profession to the best international standards, commemorates birth anniversaries of engineering grades the country has produced. Ray Vijayvardhana, also known as Renaissance Man of Sri Lanka, and upon whom in 2008 the IESL conferred its highest award of eminence in engineering for excellence in the profession, and whose 93rd birth anniversary we are commemorating today needs little introduction. Philip Revata Vijayvardhana was born in Colombo, Ceylon, on 20th August 1924. He had his primary and secondary education at Ladies College, Colombo, and St. Thomas College, Mount Lavinia. He proceeded to Peterhouse College, Cambridge University, UK, where he studied three branches of engineering, aeronautical, mechanical, and agricultural. He also earned qualifications in business administration from the Harvard Business School, and later received honorary degrees from universities in UK and Sri Lanka. Well known for his twin passions, agricultural machinery and aeroplanes, his interest in tropical farming in particular led to the design of the two-wheeled hand tractor in 1955. The invention changed the scope of farming and was soon mass produced by Landmaster in Nottingham, UK. While this is Ray's most famous contribution to date, Alongside the light aircraft he built with motor engines as a hobby, his other accomplishments are testament to a life lived to the fullest. He dedicated the rest of his life to researching and promoting ecologically sustainable agriculture and later renewable energy technologies. As a world authority on tropical farming systems, Ray worked for the UN Food and Agriculture Organizations in the early 1970s as head of agricultural engineering at the mechanization and automation research center in malaysia he then spent nearly five years as head of agricultural engineering and research at the international institute of tropical agriculture in nigeria during this time he pursued a large number of improvements and innovations to help small farmers in the developing world to grow more food without high external inputs. In particular, he promoted the technique called sloping agricultural land technology, originally developed in the Philippines. This involved terracing of land, use of leaf, and reintroducing perennial trees into rain-fed farming. Returning to Sri Lanka in 1980, he continued experimenting with rain-fed farming and agroforestry on his coconut state in Kakapalya in the northwestern province. I was fortunate enough, enough to visit the state with Dr. Ray to see his novel concepts implemented. He also did field tests for dendrothermal power, the generation of electricity from firewood. This technology is now increasingly being used by industry. 
For decades, Ray worked closely with Sri Lanka's business, research and policy communities. He held various appointments as chairman of the Tea Research Board, head of the Inventors Commission and a member of several public sector bodies concerned with agriculture, science and technology. He was Chancellor of the University of Muratua from 2002 to 2007. The Government of Sri Lanka awarded him the highest national honours of Vidya Jyoti and Desha Manya for distinguished public service. He also heavily contributed to the Junior Invent of the Year competition where he was the chief of the judge board for a long period of time. This video clip shows his last appearance at JIY final competition. So I'd uh, like to take uh, one of minute from you again. This is an email. I, I want to highlight the commitment he made to the improvement of future inventors. So this is an email Dr. Ray written to me on winning the first grand award at the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair held in Nevada in 2009. So I am sending you my most warm and deep congratulations upon your outstanding efforts to encourage young in innovators. Mr. Padmasiri's achievements are a tremendous reflection on the efforts of your whole group. They have all been so very dedicated to the encouragement of invention and this yet another achievement emphasizes the dedication of them all. It has been your fine leadership that has helped develop the spirit of innovations. My congratulations to you and your team again. I shall be most obliged if you would in future grant me more time in which to look at and study each and every invention at your such exhibitions as I like to take the time to study the inner thinking behind each such idea. It's very often the further thinking into the invention that is of particular benefit to the encouragement of the idea. I have also been very conscious of the detailed workmanship which has gone into their invention and which reflects such craftsmanship in their capabilities. For example, there are many words in English for the levels of craftsmanship which far extend beyond mere carpentry to include 
cabinet making, joinery and such specialist crafts which encourage the craftsmen from being just a mere vadubas. I was recently privileged to observe the craft of an experienced model boat builder. He was shaping the model of an ancient sailing vessel from the Portuguese era which was to comprise items in the Goa Shipping Museum. The whole museum is being reconstructed from the time of the tsunami when they were all wrecked again. Similar craftsmanship occurs with some rare and very fine pieces of furniture. I shall be most great grateful for prior advice of such exhibitions of innovation as emanate from your students so that I may take the time to observe and study each of them individually. My congratulations again, Ray. P.S. I have been keen to show and discuss with you a further extension now of mere inventing of innovating ideas. Now to the development of synergetic systems. By this means, individual ideas have synergetic capabilities, which in combination greatly exceed their individual capacities. In other words, 1 plus 1 equals 3 and 4. These complementary ideas then generate much greater advantage than the sum of their total. We have recently found this occurring in both the engineering sciences as well as the agricultural sciences. I had wished to show this in action to a small group of your lads to whom we show in both the fields of mechanical engineering as well as agricultural engineering. So this is his dedication to the innovation in the country and especially to improve the innovation culture in the future generation. So today we have raised Vijayavardhana Memorial, Vijayavardhan Memorial Lecture titled Nobody to Lead Achieving Global Leadership with Software delivered by Dr. Sanjeev Veeravarna, Chief Executive Officer of WSO2, a pioneer entrepreneur who has firmly put the country in the world map as an international software solutions provider. Over to you, Dr. Sanjeev Veeravarna. Alright, good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me to come and speak to you guys. Uh, uh, I let me start by apologizing first of all. I'm not one for formality or titles or, or being very polite. So I might probably say things that will annoy somebody here or a lot of people here. So I apologize in advance for that. Uh, but I hope I am uh, able to give you some perspectives about the software industry and what the possibilities are and, and what, uh, what it means. Um, <coughs> Um, first of all, let me uh, take a moment to thank uh, the Ray Vijayawardena Foundation, the Trust, uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's uh, it's an honor to be here. This is a name I've heard of from from the time I was a child. I read about him. I didn't know him, of course. Uh, and so it's an honor to be giving this talk. So uh, let me get started without much delay. So again, I said I don't pay much attention to titles, so I call him Ray. I'm a first first name person, so. I hope that's okay. I looked him up a little bit. The most interesting thing I found was that he went to ladies college for primary and secondary education. I don't know what connection he had to pull that off, but I'm pretty sure ladies college was not a mixed school. So that was pretty cool. Uh, uh, of course, then he made the mistake going to some cover school in Montevideo, but that's a different matter. Uh, but the interesting thing is, uh, he, he was a highly educated person. He got three degrees as an undergrad. Uh, three undergraduate degrees in education, in agriculture, in mechanical engineering, and aeronautical engineering. Right? That is pretty amazing. And then went on to do some, uh, I think an MBA or whatever it was called at the time at Harvard Business School. So, uh, and, you know, he didn't go to some little university. He went to top-notch schools, Cambridge and Harvard, uh, an extremely educated uh, person and did all kinds of things. Uh, his first invention that I had also heard about when I was a kid, when I was growing up, uh, uh, I'm only 25 years old, just can't see if I can figure that out yet, uh, was that about this little hand tractor thing, right? And, and the thing that bothered me, to be honest, about that invention was that the commercialization of that was not done in Sri Lanka. Uh, I think it was in the 1950s or 60s that he came up with the idea and, and I, being a mechanical engineer and with his background, I'm sure he made one. Uh, he took it to UK and it was commercialized and the value of the invention was derived by UK, not by Sri Lanka. Uh, so my interest is in the opposite direction. My interest is in figuring out how do you make Sri Lanka to be the place that 
owns the value, not creates the stuff only. Because creating the stuff is hard without a doubt, but it's not enough. Because if you create the stuff and the money goes out of the country, that's no good for us. We need to figure out a way to keep the money in the house somehow. So that's what my whole theme of the talk is about. Right? <clears throat> All right, so uh, uh, you don't have to read everything I put in here. I, 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 I just will talk. Um, so my objective is to give you guys a, an understanding of what's possible with software and what's possible in the software industry and how software is a, a incredible opportunity for world domination. So I, I personally think always in terms of world domination. I don't mean in a bad way. You know, we don't need to become North Korea and blow everybody up. But world domination in the sense of leading the world in whatever the heck you're doing. And with software, especially with what's going on where the technology is evolving now, anyone anywhere can become a world leader. And, and I'm going to try to talk you through what that means and, and really explain to people to, uh, uh, to help people understand what is really possible with that and then give you some examples to make the point that's actually happening already and then what we need to do to do, get a lot more of it than we are getting right now. Uh, I, I, I tend to be very blunt in what I say, so again, I apologize for that, but I uh, hope you'll enjoy the conversation. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is this concept of software is eating the world. A, 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 um, this is a, a this was an essay that was written. This title was in an essay written by this guy called Mark Andreessen. I don't know whether you know who that is. Uh, Mark Andreessen is now a venture capitalist in in the U.S. He runs a, a one of the main uh, VC firms in California called Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, he, as an undergrad at uh, University of Illinois Urbana Champaign, wrote the first web browser called Mosaic. Uh, this was in uh, I was a grad student at the time, so it was in like 1989-1990. And Mosaic is what became Netscape. And Netscape is sort of what, uh, it didn't create the internet, but it made the internet human for normal people to use. Right? The internet goes back to 1969, 1970 timeframe. But the web, the World Wide Web, which was invented primarily by Tim Berners-Lee as, as, as an engineer in, 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 in CERN in the physics lab. But a, a Mark's uh, innovation, the thing he wrote as an undergrad uh, for his final year project or whatever it was, is what changed essentially the course of history because the browser and the way the internet and information is delivered to everyone has made it so that if you're looking for an apartment in New York, you can sit in Colombo and find it. <coughs> you don't need to be there. You can be. You can look at a, a live stream of stuff. People can. I don't know whether this is being live streamed, but you can watch anything anywhere, all the time, right? Or get information from anyone to anyone else without having to go through a newspaper or a controlling authority to get information. All of that came out of this guy. So he's a pretty smart guy. So he wrote this essay, and if you haven't read it, just Google this and please read it. It's fully worth the time to read it. It's not a technical essay. It's not meant for computer science people to read. Uh, it talks about how software is taking over every aspect of life, and how software is making it possible to dramatically change the way the world operates, and the opportunity that it creates, and so forth. As a venture capitalist, of course, this guy invests uh, literally billions of dollars in software firms and they've done really really well uh, he's a very smart guy uh, but this is a great essay so this is a, a fundamental driving theme to, to help you understand let me just take you a few give to, take you through a few examples to, to understand uh, what this means so let's start with vehicles um, automotive so uh, I, I put them into old and new old Toyota VW we recognize that logo right we have a factory somewhere around here uh, GM, Ford, Hyundai, uh, and so forth. Uh, uh, these are the companies that that you know have been around for, uh, in the case of Ford, more than 100 years, I guess, uh, and so forth. They they've been the guys who innovated, and and Ford is the one that who kicked GM and Ford and Chevy and so forth to become a number one uh, automotive manufacturer and so forth. They make physical things. They make mechanical gadgets with lots of little bit of computing and so forth, but mostly mechanical things. The new car manufacturers of the world, Tesla, makes an electric car. They started off as an electric car manufacturer, but they are more now a software company because what they have is a wonderful electric car, which is controlled completely by software. Google is a is making cars. It's not commercially available yet, but Google has a full self-driving platform, and they are built. They are prototyping vehicles now. And what's going to happen eventually into the into the vehicle manufacturing industry is software will simply become the platform that you just install on a bit of hardware, you know, some wheels and a motor, and it'll take care of itself. The rest of it will drive by in software. So, so uh, all the, the old world companies are massively threatened by this. Nobody would have thought 
10, 15 years ago even that Ford and GM and Toyota can go out of business. That's a level of risk that, that uh, these companies face from essentially a little bit of hardware powered by a lot of software. I think Uber has, uh, I think like two to four million lines of software running in a single car. Right? Any average car you buy now has about 200 computers in it, individual controlling devices in it. And that's the, the regular cars. The completely software driven cars are massively powerful software machines basically. But it's not really just about vehicle manufacturing, it's all transport. So self-navigating vehicles, there, there are now, a, a, so planes, trains, automobiles is the name of a movie. A, uh, there are cars, there are trucks, there are three-wheelers, there are uh, drones, there are ships that are completely self-navigating. Right? They, don't, they don't need people anymore to drive these things. Uh, that changes delivery, that changes trucking, it changes uh, all kinds of things related to anything related to transport. Uh, uh, traffic routing, self-maintained. The car knows when the, it needs to be maintained. So I don't need to go to the mechanic and the mechanic tell me, oh, uh, you know, in my car, the, I, I took the car to Toyota recently and they say, uh, because it was making a noise and the steering car, rack has to be replaced separately. But if it was software powered, I would have known that before. The car would have contacted Toyota and found out how much it is. So they send me a message on my phone saying, yeah, I need a little bit of a fix. It's going to cost you this much. When do you want to go in? or take it a step further, look at my calendar and figure out when it can go in and go in on that day, drive itself over there, get it fixed and come back. This is not at all far-fetched. This is uh, already happening to a great extent with Boeing. Uh, Boeing has, a, a, has uh, if I remember right, eight uh, megabytes of data they capture on every takeoff and landing. Every single takeoff captures eight megabytes of data on everything going on in the plane. And they know before the plane lands what the plane needs fixing. So that software notifies the arriving airport. Uh, I don't know about Colombo airport because it takes them half an hour to get the bags out. So I don't think they have the software yet. It notifies the Colombo airport, sorry, the other airports saying, I'm coming in, I need this thing. And if they don't have it, they have software that allows the airline that owns the plane to trade for that part with other airlines right? and have that part available. And then the mechanic is wearing assisted glasses that helps them install the thing properly. Right? And it's only a matter of time before the mechanic becomes a robot and they don't need assistance, they'll just do it right one shot. So that's the path we're on. By the way, that particular Boeing system is built in WC2 software. Healthcare. Uh, so IBM has something called Watson Health. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about it. I, I think I read a paper article that uh, one of the companies in, uh, in Sri Lanka is trying to in, uh, bring it to Sri Lanka as well. Watson Health is basically a, uh, an AI system it's uh, it's not a in, there are many classes of ai it's not what's called a deep learning system it's a machine learning it, it is a uh, uh, yeah, well uh, anyway it, it, what it does really really well is um, uh, so one one use case that watson health is is beating the hell out of everybody else uh, of regular doctors is recognizing cancers so you take scans and a, a, a trained physician can look at the scan and say there might be a problem here and and the problem is that a trained physician has only been trained on the images that he or she has seen. Whereas a computer can see every image ever taken by every connected machine ever. And look at that and train itself saying, okay, this pattern means there is a problem, this pattern means there is no problem. And this is already beating doctors in how accurately it can predict that there is a problem with this particular scan. Now, it's not replacing doctors yet. It's now being deployed in some countries as an augmentation. So the doctor can give you an opinion, but the software also gives an opinion. And you know, if the doctor's opinion is off from what the software says, you should probably get a second opinion. Because the software is probably right, simply because it has more data, it can analyze more information, and it can give you more a, a, a sort of objective analysis of the information that a human being can. Right? <coughs> the second one is a picture of a nurse. It's actually not a human nurse, that's a robotic nurse in Japan. Right? A, a, uh, a nursing is a, is a big problem all over the world. There aren't enough people doing nursing. And you need a lot of skilled people, you need a lot of empathetic people, you need a lot of training, a lot of patients, all kinds of things. You know, robots are really good at most of that stuff now. Even empathy, robots are catching up on what empathy means. And one key aspect of nursing is you gotta look human and look nice and look friendly and look warm and so forth, right? It helps the person heal. So robots are being made that look like people. And it's only a matter of time before the eye movement to everything can be made to look exactly like people and act like people and, and feel like people. Uh, the third one at the bottom is a picture of a robotic surgery being done. This is becoming more and more common now, where uh, at least simple surgeries are now being fully done by robots. 
so in healthcare, and this is, uh, there are robotic stuff here, but for every bit of hardware, there's like 10 times that amount of software. Because all the control happens from software. Right? The hardware part is hard, don't get me wrong, I'm in the middle of a bunch of engineers. If I say hardware part is easy, I'm going to be in trouble. The hardware part is very hard, software part is harder. <laughs> Legal. So you think lawyers can't be replaced? Ah, come on, lawyers. Most of the time, lawyers are reading all kinds of stuff and pattern matching and giving you advice, right? Easy to replace. It's already being done. There, there is a, a uh, that's an article from 2016 about. Uh, uh, I think that's also powered by IBM Watson. Uh, and this particular one on the right is interesting. It's some some 19-year-old kid wrote a chatbot that helped. It has already helped 160,000 parking tickets to be contested. Because when you get a parking ticket. Uh, there is a contest procedure, UK, at least in in, in US and, and in uh, UK. In Sri Lanka also there's a contest procedure, but it's a different protocol. You don't need a chatbot to solve that. Uh, when you contest a parking ticket, there you have to go through some process. You have to fill in a form, you have to answer questions, all kinds of stuff. And most people are like, ah, to help with that, I'll just pay the 50 bucks, whatever, and, and be done with it because you can't be bothered to go through it. Uh, this software does that process for you. And they have overturned 160,000 parking tickets already. It was written by a 19-year-old kid. Right? Uh, so this is a, a you know earlier days. You, you can't afford to hire a lawyer because $50 is not worth hiring a lawyer, uh, and and people don't even find the time to do it. Uh, but the the software can reason just like a lawyer in this case. Right? Uh, crime and war. Uh, I'm sure everybody remembers the Bangladesh Central Bank heist because some of the money. Had channeled through Sri Lanka, and there was an, there was a, and it was recovered. I think, uh, uh, I guess it was almost a billion dollars that was uh, uh, taken by hacking into the cent uh, Bangladesh Central Bank, and a, uh, and another one is this is Ukraine power grid uh, and so forth. So there's all kinds of cyber attacks and cyber war being done through the power of software. So software has also taken over the domain of war to the extent that in the U.S. military they now have four theaters of war: land, war, air, and cyber. So cyber is an entirely different military unit now in, in the US military. And they do that because the people who fight cyber wars don't have to be able to climb a 20 foot rope and jump uh, over trees and carry a gun and so forth. They need to be able to hack. Right? It doesn't matter if they have long hair. They, they need to be, it doesn't matter if they're unfit. As long as they can hack the hell out of anything else, that's what you need. Right? So the, the troops who are in the cyber unit, and British Army has the same thing, they have an entire separate unit where they don't have normal military requirements. Uh, they are fighting a different war. Uh, world's oldest profession uh, is also being taken over by, by software. <laughs> I can't talk much about this. My daughter and parents are in front of me, so I'm not going to say much. But you can Google and read more about it. There's a lot of information. Uh, but you know, when virtual reality becomes reality, lots of things are going to change. And, and the current predictions are it will be about 2030 by the time you put a VR headset, your brain will not be able to tell the difference between reality and virtual reality. Right? And when you can't tell the difference between something, somebody touching you or something you see or something you feel or something you hear from what software is injecting into your brain, one way or the other, um, it changes everything, right? Do I need to go and visit a place? I have exactly the same feeling as if I visit it, I put this headset on and take a nap, right? Entertainment of all kinds will be possible. Education, uh, it will be incredibly different, right? So, so many things can happen with, with software. This is completely powered by software. Again, not completely. A little bit of hardware to tap into the brain and fill around and stuff like that. Easy stuff. Well, and that's politics. But unfortunately, not here. We don't have software taking over the world of politics here. But but just imagine, man, if you could export politicians. We have so many of them, right? We can get rid of them. That'd be so awesome. But but they, they also recently have said they, instead of exporting politicians, they want us to export elephants apparently. This was in, I think yesterday or day before that, that this is a, a popular thing to do these days. So uh, anyway, okay, so that's about software industry and what the world of software do. I hope you got some impression about what a, what is possible with software, and not only possible, what is happening with software. This is just a tiny, tiny bit of it, right? There, there are so many uh, other things that are happening with software that, that I didn't even touch upon uh, that, that's going on. <coughs> uh, so let's talk about, uh, sorry, I mean, let's talk about sort of. Uh, from a global perspective, software and, and competing and, and so forth, right? Uh, so let me ask you guys, what do you use? Uh, I bet most of you people, most of you guys have accounts, Gmail accounts or some kind of an Outlook or Office 365 account or a, or a Yahoo Mail account uh, for email, right? Some of you might have an SLTNet or Eureka or, or some other email platform, but most of us now use one of these email systems. 
most people use Microsoft Office, right? Word, PowerPoint, Excel. Uh, most people use Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, etc., etc. Uh, Adobe PDF, Adobe Creative Products, etc., etc. Right? Windows, Mac OS, Linux, iOS, Android, uh, Salesforce, NetSuite, Oracle, and so forth. Right? This is kind of what if you are if you're working in a company, this is your software stack that you use. Right? Uh, if you're working in a, if you're studying in a university, this is the software stack. If you're a normal person living at home and you're just communicating with your family, this is your software stack now. Right? Where does it come from? I don't have enough space to put all the logos, but they all come from that place in the world. Right? All of them. Right? That's it. There's all that other white space, but there's nobody coming from there. So I, I picked up a few other uh, titles just to make the point there are other countries that make software, but literally there's only one software product company out of Australia. Atlassian. Atlassian is an awesome company. They have a, a project management software, lifecycle development tools, fantastic stuff. We also use them great, doing really well, uh, uh, and started from Sydney and so forth, down under. Uh, and Kaspersky is a, is a Russian company that's an antivirus company. Uh, it's, it's really good. It's equally good as everybody else's uh, and, and uh, uh, fantastic company. Zendesk is an Indian company that has an office uh, software suite basically and there's a few other Indian companies but again not many Indian product companies remember I'm not talking about software services companies right? it's very very important to differentiate so let me just take a moment to explain uh, in the software industry there are people who make products that other people buy and use there are people who build solutions for people to solve their actual business problems right? there are hundreds and com of companies globally and India is pretty much the number one now for building solutions so TCS, Wipro, Infosys, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. There are hundreds of these companies. Uh, in Sri Lanka, Virtusa is the largest one that does that. And there are a bunch of other companies, lots and lots of small companies as well, who build solutions. It's a great, great model. You basically get paid for building solutions. Uh, and, and most of the time, it involves outsourcing, which comes at a low cost uh, premium primarily, and so forth. So I'm going to bash that model in a little bit later. So I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, a, but software products are different. Software product idea is. You make something and you sell it. The difference fundamentally is how much you can make from it. So if you make something and you sell it, if you make a, a, a mouse and you want to sell repeated copies of it, you have to make it over and over again right, to sell another one. If you make a hand tractor to sell 1,000 of them, you have to have a factory to make 1,000 of them. If you make a piece of software to sell it a 1,000 times, you just put it up to download right, and let people make their own copies of it. Right? They pay for the bandwidth, they get the thing. They have to buy it from you, but that's it. There is no manufacturing cost. The manufacturing cost of the of a new instance of the software is zero. Right? There's tremendous manufacturing cost of making it, designing it. It's the IP, it's the creative part of it. But once you've made it, you can sell it a million times, and it just gives you a million times the price you sell it for. That's it. Right? Very different from services stuff. In services stuff, you get paid by the hour, one way or the other. So, so it may be monthly rates, might be daily rates, it might be whatever, it doesn't matter. One way or the other, it's time and materials. So that means if you want to grow the company's revenue 10 times, you need to have 10 times the number of people, one way or the other. Right? You can twist it and slice it in different ways, but that's fundamentally how services companies work. The, the, the real value of software industry is in the products. If you look at all the companies that are at the top of the, um, the, the, the US stock market right now, it's Apple, it's Google, it's Amazon, it's Microsoft, right? all software companies. Apple also has a bunch of hardware, obviously, but very heavily powered by fantastic software they make. All are software companies. They're not services companies. All right. So why do you use this stuff? Why do I use this stuff? It's not because you're not patriotic and you don't want to buy Sri Lankan stuff for it. Right? That's not the reason. It's because we should use the best stuff. And Gmail is the best email platform. I'm sorry, Outlook and Yahoo Mail fans, but it sucks compared to Gmail. Gmail is much better. And compared to any other mail platform available, open source or whatever, I'm a big open source fan, Gmail is an order of magnitude better. That's the reality. Uh, it used to be that, that you say, well, you know, I want it localized. I want it in Sinhalese, I want it in Tamil, I want it in Hindi, I want it in Swahili, whatever. And well, you only get that from the local guy because those guys can't be bothered. But guess what? That is over. Google Voice Translate now will translate Sinhalese into English. And the way they do it is completely with machine learning. They have simply taken enough instances of singular things to English things and pattern match the hell out of it, um, simplifying it beyond if there's any AI savvy people that will kill me for this. 
Param Nachahalovitz that anything you say can be translated to English. Anything. Right? Uh, that means earlier there was, a, there was a challenge in translating software or making it localized. No more. If you want to save something in Sinhalese, you can do it. In, and there's a standard called Unicode that is used for making international writing possible. Uh, every piece of software supports it. So, so the entire uh, challenge of saying it's local, it's special is over because everybody has it now. And, and, and Google is far ahead in this space. Microsoft is very close to them. Uh, this is commodity technology. It's only a matter of time before any piece of software can be made available in any language without too much hassle. <coughs> uh, the other thing is, uh, it used to be that, that uh, uh, if you buy some software, you need a lot of training, a lot of documentation, people read instructions. You know, it's like buying a, buying a TV. Before you can turn it on, you need to, need to read that silly book. But a good piece of software, nobody ever reads any book. You know, you get a Gmail account, you kind of know what to do. It, it helps you figure it out. It's, it's natural. Uh, the same thing with, with, the, with, the, with Facebook or anything like that. You don't need somebody to show you how to do something. You don't need to read a manual. You certainly don't need somebody coming and giving you a training session on it. Right? So, so it's an entirely different, uh, different model. Uh, and another argument that people used to have is, well, you can buy local stuff because it's cheaper. But most of this stuff is free. Half the things I went through is free software. Anybody can use it free of charge. Now you'd ask, what's the catch? What are they getting out of it? The catch is they're learning everything about you. Right? Google knows if you use Gmail, Google knows when you're going to travel, Google knows who your friends are, Google knows what you like, Google knows if you buy something, Google knows if you, if you send some photos, Google knows if you browse some interesting website, Google knows everything about you. Right? That's why they're giving it to you free. You think it's free, it's a drug, you're completely addicted, you can't get out of it, and it's awesome for them because they can now market to you, they advertise to you, etc. So, so, and, and so just saying it's cheaper is no longer a useful answer because you're competing with free and you can't. The other, the other aspect is the, the primary point, and this is the main point that I want to make across this presentation, is that software is a global thing. There is no concept in software of Oh, I need to buy something locally. I need to buy something uh, specialized for me. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, one of the things that, that used to work for selling things was this concept of information asymmetry. That is, the buyer doesn't know as much as the seller does about what they're selling. That's not true anymore because if you're going to buy something, you Google it up, right? Or you Bing it up. I don't know anybody who uses Bing, but whatever, right? So you search for it and you learn about it. You can learn more than the silly salesperson can tell you nowadays because there's comparative stuff. You can see competitors' information talking about that. You can see other happy users. You can see unhappy users. You can see all that information, completely available, free of charge, anybody to see. Right. So, so, so this information asymmetry part is over now. The other part is nobody came and sold you Gmail or Facebook, right? Nobody told you to buy the account. Nothing. You just somebody told you about it. Went to the website. You signed up. So a you don't need physical presence to sell somewhere anymore. Right? One of the companies I'm going to talk about today has customers in 190 countries. Right? And they have no physical presence in any of those countries except one. Right? They just find out about it and they use it. That's what it means. Uh, and in the world of software, you can't protect it. So, so uh, there was this, uh, you know, during, uh, there was this lovely debate in Sri Lanka about something called EdCup. Uh, and there was this politicians were arguing, saying, well, you know, we've been protecting the software industry, it's time to remove the barriers and let them compete for their own good. It's complete garbage because, with all due respect to politicians, uh, because a, there is no such thing called protection in the software industry. There is no protection possible. It's a URL on the website. Unless you become like China and control internet access to particular websites, you cannot control somebody from competing in your market. No way. It's impossible. Anybody can go to any website and pick it up and use it. That's it. Right? And we are too small to be like China. China can do that because they have a billion plus people and there's an entire different marketplace there. And they're doing really great doing that. Right? Some of this, I think Alibaba has 3 million customers, 3 million companies as customers. Right? So it, it, that's the scale they operate at. And, and another thing that a lot of software companies in Sri Lanka try to focus on, well, I'm going to try to sell to the region. What, what, what's, what, uh, to me, the concept of region is absolutely meaningless in the world of software because there is no concept of region. Because if some a piece of software is good enough for somebody in Sri Lanka, is good enough for somebody in Bangladesh, you know, somebody in India, why is it not good enough for somebody in Australia or Japan or, or, or UK or US or Canada or Brazil? 
because if it's if it's not good enough that means they are finding something better than whatever we are offering in that case those users will go and get that just like gmail right? uh, because why are we using gmail because there is nothing better than gmail out in sri lanka right if there was a better thing in sri lanka we can use it yeah, and there simply isn't that's not the way software works software is completely global so i'm going to talk you through a couple of examples just to give you some idea of some stuff that is going on uh, in Sri Lanka in various companies. So first one is Cradley. I don't know whether Chandika is here, but uh, Cradley is a company that was started by Chandika Jayasundar. Uh, uh, they have this is the company I was talking about. They have two million users in 190 countries, and there are 20 people working in the company. Right, that's it. And operating completely out of Sri Lanka, zero direct sales. Their customers are from lots of companies that didn't have enough space to uh, top global companies whatever random all kinds of places all over the world 190 countries are using software from Creately. design made manufactured delivered operated everything done in sri lanka right uh, chandika and there's a uh, uh, there's 20 people in the company um, and a, and they they registered the company in australia uh, and they've raised three hundred thousand dollars that's it and after that it's a profitable business Right. So this is an example of a software company that is a, a impacting 2 million users in almost 200 countries, that is pretty much the entire world, right? And having incredible customers uh, all over the place just with 20 people operating it. Uh, this is an amazing story. This is a, a company called Foraxis Solutions. Um, a, this was a, a third year university student uh, team from uh, IT faculty in University of Morotur. Uh, this was, uh, there was a MIT uh, program in Sri Lanka, I can't remember the name of it, uh, GSL, yeah. Uh, and uh, this was a project that came out of that. Uh, these guys basically want to create a drawing tool. They are passionate about drawing. And they created a drawing tool, uh, I don't know whether the is here, but I can't see these guys. Uh, 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 and this tool is a number one rated app for that space. They get 10,000 downloads a day. Right? WSO2 gets 10,000 downloads a month. So they get 10,000 downloads a day. A different market, so you know, it's not a different world, but still, that's incredible. And uh, it's 14 people now, no funding taken, profitable business generating revenue for Sri Lanka. Registered in Singapore. I'm going to touch upon this particular point in, in a minute. It's an amazing, amazing stuff. Awesome product, and and uh, uh, really committed to solving these problems. Uh, this is another interesting one. This is a, a company called Paracom Technologies. Most of you probably haven't heard of it. Uh, uh, started by Ajit Pascal, who happens to be my classmate when I was in in, in school. Ajit is a, a professor in uh, electrical engineering, electronic engineering in Mortua. Uh, he was the head of the department. I think he's not anymore. Uh, they started this company to create hardware product innovation. But it's actually interesting. This is hardware but done with software that is this particular devices they make they design everything in software and the manufacturing is they just send the instructions to print the hardware out kind of to China and China breaks it and sends it back to them that's how they do it so so the manufacturing part is just robots now there's no innovation there's no IP there's no creativity it is just just sit and print the damn things out and make them one by one Right? And the robots will do that. The entire product design, product manufacturing, figuring out what to make, how to make it work, how to make it handle heat, all of that is done here. This is a incredible hardware for, uh, I can't remember which it which stands for, DPIs, deep packet inspection, uh, video, and some, yeah, video encoding stuff that they're doing. Right? It's some 4K video encoding stuff. They are the first company in the world to have made that in hardware. They are one of the fastest in the world in that space. Uh, done completely in Sri Lanka. Right? 30 engineers, no funding and now selling the product in Sri Lanka and, and other countries. So we are actually buying the, the packet inspection engine. We can use it for our network uh, management. Um, Adrive Logic, Asanka is here. Uh, Adrive Logic is an enterprise middleware company. They're actually one of our competitors. Uh, uh, and they have an ESB and integration technology. And again, a, a profitable, no, no investment taken. And their, one of their customers is the world's the number, Fortune 1 Walmart is a customer of Android Logic, right? Built, operated, run completely in Sri Lanka, uh, and, and a whole bunch of others. Uh, amazing success. Uh, WSO2, we are about four, we have about 400 customers in 31 countries, 
We have only nine in Sri Lanka. We have about 450 people in Sri Lanka. All the innovation, everything is done here. Uh, and uh, marketing, all, all, most of the work is done from Sri Lanka, uh, registered in the US. And there's a bunch of others in Sri Lanka. So my apologies, I don't mean to slight anybody I didn't mention. I took these few examples because they, they helped me make the point that I want to make. But there are a whole bunch of others who are also doing interesting stuff here. Right? Uh, so let's just take a step back and see what's common about these people and these guys and, and things. Right? Uh, the first, thing, first one is very, very important. It is deeply caring about the problem they're solving. They're incredibly passionate about the problem. If you ask the Forex's guys, their objective is to take down Adobe. And I don't mean in a bad way, but in a good way. So, you know, make Adobe go home and they become the number one creative software platform provider. Right? Uh, if you talk to uh, 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 creative, uh, creatively, sorry, uh, they have similar objectives. World domination mindset. No, zero idea of local or regional market concept. Thinking global, completely global, and looking totally at the entire world as a market opportunity, not some little opportunity. Raise the focus on quality, right? Absolute raise the focus because to get 10,000 downloads a day of a product is incredible, right? And these are like normal people downloading software. So uh, the, when, I, when I first learned how to program, when I was an undergrad, I had a job working in, in the heating plot at Kent State University. And, and I used to, uh, I, I used to work from midnight to eight, Friday and Saturday. And uh, the guy who employed me realized I was a computer science student. So he asked me to write a program to, to enter this EPA monitoring data, Environment Protection Agency monitoring data. And I, so I wrote this program in Pascal, in a language called Pascal. Uh, and the person who would use it was this really, you know, uh, old lady who was using, who, who used to work during the daytime. And what I learned from that was writing software for normal people, that is not computer science people, not engineers, is really hard. But they tap every key sequence you can imagine. Why in the world would you go and touch that key after this key? It makes no sense. You're in the middle of entering a number, right? But they do that. So writing a piece of software that gets normal people happily using it, not engineers, not software people, is really hard. And that's an amazing focus on quality. And, and again, mindset. Mindset is want to win the entire market, not be a, a person who is playing in the market. Right? You, can't, you can't, if you're going to play in the world of software, you have to go in with brutal, bloodthirsty mindset saying, I'm going to go win this market. This is not a game. We are trying to take down the other guys. We are trying to become number one. Obviously, not everybody gets to be number one. If you go to 20% market share in the market, generally that's considered a market leader. Right? So objective is to become a market leader, not to get a tiny market. Every one of these markets we are talking about, these companies, a, a, uh, these are between these five of whatever companies I went through, there's probably a 100 to 500 billion dollar market opportunity. So it's massive markets I'm talking about, right? But so you're going for 20 percent of that, not not a small amount of market share. Uh, and the other one is, uh, if if you ever start a company, one thing you realize is there are shit loads of challenges. Everything that can go wrong goes wrong. Uh, every possible scenario that you don't think can happen will happen. And but you have to still keep going. And that's a, that's a big part of it. Uh, and and overall, uh, there's a belief that. Sri Lanka is not second class. If you talk to the people who founded these companies, you see there is no mindset saying, well, you know, we're competing with California. It's hard to compete with California. It's competing in New York or Sydney or India or whatever. No, you know, there is no such thing in this world in software. If you have a computer and you have a brain and you have internet connection, you're equal to everybody else. The only limiting factor is your brain, your, inter your interest, your passion, your commitment, your dedication, how hard you're willing to work at the problem. That's it. Everything else is completely, you know, up to up to the person. And and one other interesting one is of this lot, only one was a young founder. I think Chandika might take issue with that, but uh, I think everybody else was, let's say, more than thirty, except me, of course. Right? So it was more than thirty when, when when the company was founded. Uh, and again, I'm going to come back to that point in a little while later. Uh, <coughs> all right. So let me talk a little bit about uh, entrepreneurs and what it, what what kind of mindset it takes to be entrepreneurial to take these challenges and, and from a global challenge perspective right? because this is something that I'm very passionate about because I, I, I see a, a lot of uh, uh, to be blunt wrong positioning by a bunch of people about wh how entrepreneurs are supposed to work so my, my view of entrepreneurs is really really simple uh, you know life is full of problems right everybody runs into problems when you run into problems you have three options 
You can ignore it, right? Sorry, you can start off by complaining about it. That's what we usually do, right? So, oh, oh, that's terrible, you know, that's dirty, that's smelly, that's not cool, whatever. Right? Complain about it. And you tell your friends complaining about it. That's the number one thing. Number two is ignore it. Say, well, you know, tune it out of your mind so you don't see it. And the third thing is do something about it. And to me, entrepreneurs are the people who, when they see a problem, they say, I'm going to do something about that. Right? And, and say, I'm, I want to do something about that because I'm passionate about that problem. <clears throat> so one key aspect of that is you have to learn to see problems. Because your brain, you know, we are, we are trained, I, I don't know whether it's cultural or whatever, right? We, we are trained to either complain or ignore, for the most part. Not to say, I'm going to take this problem and solve it. Because we don't have that in So we have to train our mind to do that. When you see a problem, capture it. So one thing is, we experience the problems ourselves. It's not, problems are not some foreign thing you need to read about in a book, right? These are problems we can experience. When you, when you experience them, you can record them in your brain and say, aha, that's a problem. And a problem can be viewed as an opportunity if you want to look at it as an opportunity. The other one is you can observe when other people experience problems. You can see somebody struggling doing something, then you can say, well, that's an opportunity. Can I make that better? Right? And the third one is some people are really good at this, which is predicting that this problem is going to occur because of this thing that happened in the world. What can we do something about that? Right? If you can identify a problem and then you can work on that solution, that's an opportunity. So, so to become entrepreneurial, to me, it's, it's really simple. It doesn't require a degree in, I don't even know what a degree in entrepreneurship is or what a course in entrepreneurship is. To me, it is simply saying, start giving a damn, that's it, right? Give a damn and start figuring out, okay, now I give a damn, now I need education because I can't do something about certain things. Now these guys who are in the, in the, in the examples that took, uh, went through, every one of them has education. They have the knowledge to do something about it. You can't, without knowledge, you can't do something about it. Second part is to become a visionary. What does becoming a visionary mean? That means you should be able to close your eyes and imagine a future that doesn't yet exist and see it in, in chroma color, or whatever, I'm colorblind, so whatever the color palette that you want to pick up, right? A, and then you figure out how do I get there from here? Can you plot, plot a path from here to there? Can you convince somebody that there is such a path? Tell that story and then get other people to follow you down that path. That's it. Right? It's not that hard. So people who are considered visionaries are people who can blind themselves, cover their eyes from all the crap that's going on, figure out, see something that doesn't yet exist and say, I'm going to go after that and plot a path to that and then get to that point. And, and to do that requires, again, a focus, identifying problems and paying attention to uh, those aspects. So finally, when, when, you, when you've got a, a uh, when, when you see you want to do something about something, you need the tools to do something. You need education. That's where education is key, knowledge and education. Uh, and and uh, this stuff is not about passing A-levels. Actually, yesterday I read a, I, I almost put it somewhere here. I read a, a very sad uh, posting somebody had put on Facebook. And it just illustrated in crystal clear terms the problem with our A-level mindset. Uh, this guy had written on Facebook, that uh, he uh, he is very sad about the day he got his A level results because he couldn't uh, his father's wish had been he would get enough A level results to get into the University of Morocco to become an engineer and 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 and, and he didn't get his results and uh, you know whatever A levels he didn't do well and he had uh, and and then uh, so he said I you know to him he let down his father completely that day and the father had passed away a year later but this guy has done really well and he's very successful. But to him, that is like a, a, a complete tragedy in his life. Right? To me, that's a, you know, uh, that's a major failing, first on the parent side. Uh, whether you do well at 19 is not the point. Right? Uh, I was going to put a picture, I forgot to put it. Uh, there's a, there was a billboard in US 101 uh, North in, in uh, somewhere near San Francisco, which said, the first person to live to 150 is already born. It was a billboard from Prudential, you can look it up. Uh, potential health insurance. Uh, the first person to live to 150 is already born. So why in the world are we worrying about whether you get enough education when you are 18 or 19? If you can live to 150, right? What are you going to do by retiring at 55? You're going to live another whole freaking 100 years. Right? Whether you like it or not, you're going to have to deal with that nonsense. So, a, a, a declaring people as failures because they screw up A-level is a tragedy in our system. 
right? And we, uh, and uh, I mean, uh, to me, we see so many people who have given up on life and, and like say, okay, I, I guess I'm now second class because I didn't do well in my A-level exams. It's just retarded. That's it. There's nothing where to put it. It's absolutely retarded. So, so it's not about formal education. There are plenty of amazing innovators who had no formal education. Steve Jobs started Apple, right? Dropped out of university after one year, and, and he was studying calligraphy and various other things. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, who started a, a Facebook, and dropped out of Harvard after a couple of years. Uh, had 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 knowledge, had, could program the hell out of all kinds of things. Uh, Bill Gates, a, a doctor of Harvard. Right? Uh, these are random, uh, hi, these are the, the highlight examples, but there are thousands of others who have done really, really well as well. That is not to say formal education is not important and not good. I spent nine years in university studying before I, I did anything. Uh, and, and it, but it is not a stopping factor for people to learn. There is continuous education opportunity for anyone now to anywhere in the world. You just go to coursera.edu, you go to edex.org. There's free content on learning anything you want today, right? You don't need to go to university. You don't need anybody's approval. You don't need somebody to say, yeah, you're yeah, good enough to take this course. You just take it. That's it. End of story. Most of it is free. <clears throat> if you want a certificate, you can pay for it. And, and uh, Elon Musk, you know, amazing guy, right? Uh, Tesla, solar power, rockets, going to Mars, tunneling, all kinds of stuff. Uh, I don't know how much you've read about his education, but the guy uh, has a... Uh, he's a, if I remember right, he's a, he was doing a PhD in uh, theoretical physics or something. Uh, he has a computer science or, or uh, some kind of a mathematical training. And he's an amazingly smart guy. He was at Stanford and he gave up on that, on Stanford in the PhD because it was in the 90s. And he realized, wait a second, if I stay in university through the 90s, I'm going to miss this internet boom. Right? He started PayPal because he was like, wait, if I stay in university for five years to getting a PhD, this whole hot rod of the internet startup is going to go away from me and so he quit and started PayPal and he sold PayPal for I don't know 200 million dollars or something and that's what gave him the money to start Tesla and all this other stuff right uh, uh, so you know uh, I don't know do you watch the videos of, of uh, 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 the SpaceX rocket going up and then coming back and landing on a robotic uh, platform in the sea right that's obviously very hard you know it's, it's a rocket coming down from space landing onto a floating platform but if you think about it, you know, you see magicians throwing a piece of wood up and balancing back on their finger. It's the same physics. It's a hell of a lot of calculation to make that work. Our brain does it naturally for something small. And a lot of control infrastructure done with software. But you need incredible knowledge to pull that off. <coughs> so if you want to be an innovator, you have to learn. You can't, you can't just not learn. And again, Ray is a great example, you know, amazing education. Uh, and, and that's what gave him the tools to be able to, to do something. It's important to start caring and identify problems and then want to do something. But if you don't have the tools, you can't do something. Right? You have to build the tools. And it's not impossible. It's possible for anybody now. <coughs> uh, a, a, another one a, a, I'm going to pick on a little bit is, is uh, age. Uh, you see lots of entrepreneurial focus these days on, on uh, university students, on 20-something saying, uh, we try and replicate the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world. For every Zuckerberg who is successful, there are thousands and probably hundreds and thousands of people in that age group who don't make it in that path. It's, it's not easy to be at that opportunity and see it through. We have one example that I went through, which is in that exact category, right? They're in the university, they started this idea. The other examples are not like that. I was 38 years old, now I'm 25. I was 38 years old and I started the company 12 years ago, right? And I had, I had nine years in university. I worked in IBM research for eight years before starting the company. Right. In next May, I'll complete 30 years since I did my bachelor's degree. So to me, this focus on 20-something as the way you come up with stuff is, is, is not, not, not the right thing to do. Entrepreneurialism is about having interest and caring about something and then having the tools to do something about it. And tools obviously involves knowledge, involves funding, involves building other people, leadership skills, all of that. But all of that can be built if you want to do something. Uh, so to me, it takes two things. One is knowledge and experience. The other is young and foolish. Right. Young and foolish means believing that, that you can do something that other, pe other more experienced people say, ah, come on, you can't do it. And I'll give you one example. When I was, before I started WC2, I was working in IBM Research. I, I built this system uh, with sort of the precursor of what we ended up doing in WC2 uh, in IBM Research. And I, took, uh, I presented at the WebSphere Platform Architecture Board 
uh, and uh, I'm not going to name the guy, uh, he's a senior guy in IBM now. Uh, he was one of the, the main architects of, uh, of WebSphere mainframe at the time. And, and he came and said, so you think you can start with the JVM and rebuild everything we've got, right? Uh, and and uh, I was like, um, yeah, I mean, how hard is it? And then his answer was, you have no freaking idea what you're talking about, you know, what you're getting into, how hard it is. And we've done it, we've done it over and over again now. Uh, the point is, uh, and yes, he was absolutely right, I had no freaking idea how hard it was, right? But it's okay, you figure it out as you go along. Right? So, so sometimes when you become old, and I, I don't mean old in a bad way because I'm in that category, uh, I mean as in senior and, and, and so forth, you tend to become narrow-minded and think that, well, you know, this problem has been tried before, it's hard to do, you can't do it. And every problem in the world that gets solved by someone later is a problem that's been tried before and someone gave up on it. Right? And the context, the environment, the timing, the opportunity, the people, the technology changes. So the same problem might be solvable a year from now, or two years from now, ten years from now. Best example, uh, anybody remember something called the Apple Newton? Right? Most people are old enough to remember Apple Newton. Apple Newton was a precursor to the iPod, the iPad, sorry, uh, well, iPod, I guess, done by Steve Jobs in uh, mid-90s, complete failure. It had a, a touch-based thing, it had a, a pencil, it was like the uh, the PDA, it was like a, you know, better than, if you remember the PDA generation, it's like better than PDA. Completely died and almost killed Apple. Steve was, Steve Jobs was fired, etc., etc. Right? Uh, and iPod came back around and changed the company, right? iPhone, iPod, etc., etc., right? All that is, so it's same concept, same idea done with different technology. That thing was a brick. I mean, that was like an inch and a half thick. It was like this size. Uh, and you know, uh, unusable really. But when the iPod came out, it was you know, 10 millimeters high and tiny, and, and a much better touch sensor, multi-touch, blah blah blah. So a, a timing matters. So so to me, a, a, uh, a, to become really entrepreneurial, you have to have a combination of both knowledge and experience and being young and foolish at the same time, right? And and the entrepreneurial age of someone is not directly correlated to the age how long you've been alive. There are amazing kids. There's one guy uh, uh, I know who, uh, Harsha Purasinghe, I don't know if he's not here, but Harsha started this company called Microimage when he was 19. And he had been programming since he was 14. Uh, Mohundan Kanegi, who was the CEO of Victor, resigned uh, some, uh, uh, he's, he's a politician guy now, so he's, but he, he uh, I, I know Mohundan. Mohundan said he started at 14, he had written some software and sold it to Chinese Dragon. Uh, to do restaurant management or whatever, menu management, something or the other, right? So, so there are people who are uh, young at amazing ages and do amazing things. There are also people who are young at much higher ages and do amazing things. So there's no connection between the two. So, so focusing on 20 somethings is silly. And I'm gonna give you two quick examples. One is my father, he's sitting right there. Uh, he got a, um, uh, in 19, uh, sorry, in 2012, he got a, a National Science Foundation a research uh, uh, grant for two million rupees to do this spirulina thing, I, I don't quite know what it is, some, some protein growing thing. Uh, and, and he was recognized for it as, as a successful completion of the project in 2016. He was 80 years old when he got this grant. Okay. So, and of course, gray, right? And everything I remember about this guy, he had gray hair. I don't have gray hair, so I'm much younger, but uh, uh, you know, I, 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 every time I've seen a picture, I remember you know this crazy guy flying a uh, flying a motorbike or something like that uh, in Colombo. So that's what I remember, uh, you know, reading in the 80s. And he had gray hair, right? He was not a not a kid when he was innovating, and so there's no correlation between the two. You can innovate at any age, and it doesn't matter. And it's great if you can do it in your 12. So my advice, I'm going to give some advice and I'm going to wrap up. Uh, uh, it's free advice, so you know, take it for what it's worth. Uh, so first of all, the consumers. If you're a consumer, if you're a person using technology, don't accept second class, demand the best. Nobody's using Creately or Four Axis because it's made in Sri Lanka. I'll bet none of you guys who, who have used it, even knew it was made in Sri Lanka. Right? Uh, and it doesn't matter because that's the way software works. And, and the opportunity for software companies is to step up and get to that point and to challenge them. So push local organizations to become the best. And, and don't give local any credit on that front, on quality and capability and system capacity and what it can do and so forth. Uh, uh, so this is a, a, a two enterprises. This guy in the picture is a guy called Prakash Iyer. 
Uh, he was CTO of a company called Atroad, which is now part of Trimble. Uh, Prakash a, was WSO2's first ESP customer. And he, he, and we had no customers at the time, right? So here, this is a big US corporation buying some software from a bunch of people living in Sri Lanka, uh, selling it to them. And he bought it and he said, uh, I, I had a company, I started a company before and I am doing this because I know how difficult it is to get the first customer, right? And I'm gonna give you guys, a, and, and you know, we were a risky buy, right? Because we were small, uh, we, everything worked perfectly fine, we had no issue, but it was an unknown company from some unknown part of the world. A, a lot of companies have this ridiculous requirement that, oh, we'll only buy from somebody who's got $20 million revenue or something like that. Government tenders in Sri Lanka love to do this. 500 million rupee annual turnover or else you can't bid for it. But what does that say to entrepreneurs in Sri Lanka, right? You say, well, don't bother dealing with the government because you can't sell to them. They can't buy it from you. That's ridiculous. You have to give people a chance. But I'm not asking you to give them a chance because they are local. It should be, can you meet what we need? And don't do it with this RFP mindset, request for proposal mindset, because when you buy software, a lot of people say, well, here are all the features I might need for the next 10 years of my software. Well, yeah, it's in 10 years, right? I don't have it today, so what? You don't need it right now. Tell me what you need now. If you've got that, and if I can give you a path to giving you what you need next year and the year after, give me a shot, right? And give people an opportunity. And, and the last, that quote is from, from a local customer, I'm not gonna name the company, they evaluated WC2's ESP and, and some other uh, uh, US company one. And he basically said, you know, uh, EOS is fine, but the other one had more buttons. We like the buttons better. <laughs> They're fine, you can be with your buttons. Uh, so, uh, 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 and we've had multiple local customers tell us, well, you're a Sri Lankan company, we're buying an American piece of software. Like, really? Do you know where that American piece of software is written? It's either in Sri Lanka or in India. Uh, so, so a, a lot of buyers in Sri Lanka have a hell of a lot of ego when it comes to local software companies. Because, number one reason, most people are not connected, powerful people who come and sell you this stuff. Right? I don't come from a connected, powerful thing. Everything I've done was a combination of education and hard work and opportunity derived out of that. Right? Uh, I know these guys, who are, these companies uh, are same same story. Right? And when a big buyer looks at them, they're like, who are you now? Right, I'm, you know, I'm CIO of this big company. Who are you? Well, bullshit. It doesn't look like that, right? It's a matter of what's the innovation value you're bringing. Consider that, compare that analytically with whether it's IBM or Oracle or Microsoft or whatever. It doesn't matter. No problem. We can compete with those guys. It's piece of cake. Those guys have similar people like us. There's no difference. I used to work in IBM Research for eight years. IBM has people no different than us. In fact, our people are much better than, on average, than people in IBM. To government, okay. So I mentioned precisely where these companies were registered. Why are they registered out of Sri Lanka? Actually, there's one registered. So Paragon Technology is registered in Sri Lanka, so great for uh, Everybody else is out of the country. Why? So I'll tell you from WS2Y. Uh, this is in 2005 we started the company. In fact, uh, 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 my original objective was to call the company Serendip, but Serendip.com, uh, uh, sorry, we're going to call it Serendipity. Serendipity.com was not available, and you can't have a company without its .com available. Uh, so we called it Serendip Systems and, and started the company. Uh, and then the person who was investing said, well, I don't like that name, you change the name, otherwise you can't have my money. So, great, we change the name. Uh, and it was registered in the US because a, a, there was no way at the time for a foreign investor to have trust in the Sri Lankan legal system, saying, if I invest money, this guy won't run away with the money or do something and I have no recourse. And, and later, we raised $4 million from Intel Capital. Intel had never invested in a company in Sri Lanka uh, at the time. I think they had something in India at the time, probably. And they, uh, they gave the money in two tranches because they were concerned that uh, they didn't know us, right? They transferred the money to a WSU bank account completely under our control. We can transfer the money to Bermuda and say, well, thanks a lot with middleware crap. I'm going home now, right? Uh, so th that trust was not there um, and, and so forth. So, uh, so the government, you know, if you want to support innovation, entrepreneurship, enterprises, business development, all that kind of stuff in Sri Lanka, number one, you can't treat annual taxes as a toy every year and say, well, this year is 14%, next year is 18%, next year is 22%. It doesn't work like that, right? Tax policy, uh, vehicle import, po well, vehicle import policy actually changes every other week, depending on who wants to import a vehicle for this week. Uh, <laughs> and which one's sitting in the port and they want to bring that one in. So that's another whole story. Uh, uh, that doesn't work. 
Because people who invest in a company want to know that the conditions under which I invested, that ground framework won't change. Because if it changes, I don't know what the hell I'm going to get out of it. Can I get it out? Will it ever po be possible? Does the legal system support me? Do I have to sit in court for the next 10 years to get it out? You know, if somebody does something wrong. So those, those things really do matter. A, 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 uh, hiring and firing, our, our labor rules, it's great. We need the labor rules. But in an industry that pays way above market rate, we can come up with a policy saying, well, if you're paying two to three times market rate, you know, uh, risk return. Employees take the risk. In, in return for getting a higher reward, right? And makes it possible because many of these companies cannot operate with committing to how the company is going to shake out. Most startups fail. That's the way it works. 90% of startups fail in the first year, right? I think 95% of startups never get to a million dollars of revenue. That's the way it works. And the other one is, you know, corruption is okay in my view, but give me a reasonable and non discriminatory corruption. <laughs> if I come to buy and if he comes to buy and if she comes to buy, give same level of corruption to all of us, then we can play. Right? You want your 10%, 20%, whatever, that's fine. But don't give me different levels of corruption. It's very hard to work with it. And the other one is get out of the way. We don't need government help in the software industry. Right? You don't need the only thing you need is help, you know, if if let government buy Sri Lankan software. That means remove that procurement guideline which says you must have five hundred million rupees of turnover before you can sell, because none of us have that kind of stuff. Right? You can't sell like that. Uh, so if you're an entrepreneur, you know, a entrepreneur, being an entrepreneur is hard, right? A, a, I have pitched WSO2 to, to myself, I have presented WSO2 to about 125 different VCs. Only four have said yes. Right? The other 121 of that probably uh, 80 or 90 don't reply your mail after some time. The other people said, well, sorry guys, you know, great, but not for us, right? It's not easy to keep doing that over and over again. That's what it takes. And, and but a, 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 if you want to solve the problem, if you're passionate about the problem, suck it in and do it. That's what it takes. Keep going. You don't stop. The other part is a, if you really want to, a, with software, unlike the days of Ray Vijayawadana when he was making things that required physical presence, physical manufacturing, software is a different game. Creately runs everything in, in, in the cloud. They have a bunch of servers. I don't know where I'm guessing Amazon uh, It doesn't matter. They're hosting it somewhere and people just log in and use it They never go to a customer site. They never go to a customer's country customers never go and meet them nothing They just pay by credit card. That's it right? You can reach the entire world market like that. That is the opportunity for software uh, and and the interesting thing for companies in Sri Lanka is Stop worrying about tiny Sri Lanka market opportunities because we are a tiny country we have less than 0.3% of the world population. Creating a software solution, a product that targets that is almost silly because if it's good enough for those people, it's going to be good enough for some other country. That means somebody else is targeting the bigger country. That means they're going to invest more and build a better product than you are and you're going to lose. Right? The protection is not there. You don't have the local coverage. You don't have any of that stuff. So you need to compete globally and it's easy. It's not hard in software. It's not many other areas is much harder. In software, it's completely in your brain and how much you're willing to put into it. The other one is share the opportunity with the team. So this is, to me, this is a big one. A, 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 if you are a startup technology company, you have to, the employees have to be part of the equation. It's high risk. And there has to be high reward potential, right? If you don't share it, that's not good. A, a, uh, the other one is, is a, a, in, in Sri Lanka, uh, you know, we don't have, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit towards the, uh, right at the end. There aren't many intrinsic advantages that any country has in the world of software. Everything I say today applies to somebody in India or in China or in California, right? Because it's just completely open. There is no, there's nothing. What do you have, what we have, are things that we have specialized in, that we have innate understanding of the problems and therefore understanding of the opportunities, or should, should be able to identify the opportunities in which are in travel, in security. We went through 30 years of terrorism and major war, which almost the entire rest of the world is going through yet, right? We can use that. Can we figure out what kind of software solutions we can build to help and sell, sell to other people? Garbage, you know, we have lots of problems with garbage. Corruption, if you can monetize corruption, that's a great model. <laughs> so investors don't focus only on the 20 something people. They're great, they're awesome, but they're not the only ones, right? Innovation doesn't come at, with an age limit. Anybody can do it. And demand world domination thinking, and right along with that, you have to risk more. 
uh, we have too much of uh, uh, a, a, a companies think too small, investors think too small. As a result, you put in you know five million rupees and say I want thirty percent of the company. Unfortunately, five million rupees doesn't go a very long way to pay engineers to write software uh, and and to keep it going and buy the servers or buy the laptops and and so forth and so forth, right? So you need more money than that to make it go. And the other thing is when you are talking about uh, more uh, uh, older uh, founders, you can't say, well, you know, you don't need a salary for the next two years. You can live like you were in the university. It doesn't work like that because you have family commitments. You have, you know, you have a home, you have a car, you have children. You have all these things you got to keep taking care of while you're doing doing all of this, all the software things. So it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, um, to the IT industry, I'm going to get love for this one. Um, you know, we have we, we keep talking about one billion, two billion, five billion revenue stuff. Uh, to me, this is completely nonsense. It is impossible. I can tell you right now, it is impossible to make five billion dollars of revenue in software product stuff without going maybe 25 years. And that's if your company is successful for 25 years. Right? A, a, a Red Hat, which is I think a lot of people know who Red Hat is, Red Hat took 20 years to a billion dollars in revenue. Uh, that's kind of what it takes. So these numbers are all about services. It's all about people. The problem with selling people is one x return. You sell a hundred people, you get a hundred dollars. You sell two hundred people, you get two hundred dollars. The good thing with selling software is is five to twenty x return. The value of a software company that makes a million dollars revenue is somewhere between five and twenty million dollars. And if you are really hot, you can go even further. Uh, uh, that is the that is the opportunity for uh, for software for product based software companies. Uh, 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 the number of people employed, I, I know we need to create employment. I know if you're a government, you have to create employment and all of this. Uh, but if you notice, all the companies I went through had tiny number of employees, and yet impacting significant world opportunity, because you don't need to have a lot of people to do a whole lot of stuff. You need to have few good people. And you can do amazing things with a few good people. So, so having a model that is focused on on promoting numbers of people and really unachievable revenue targets. To, sorry, but to put it bluntly, is pointless because it's not really going to get us anywhere. Maybe, but if we can build ten companies, each of which can have a market cap of say hundred million dollars, right, and they can be sold to someone. Then we can make a billion dollars coming into the country. That's what Israel does. If you want to follow any country for software industry, it's Israel, not India. Israel, Israel actually has a very strong military connection. Almost all software companies come out of the military because they have a military requirement, and military does a lot of software-related work. And they spin off companies, and a lot of those companies end up getting funding, and then they go get sold to primarily U.S. companies, right? And drives a lot of money coming in. Uh, we, we need to follow that model, not the other model. Uh, celebrating failure is important. Again, in the software industry, if you don't, if you don't fail regularly, you are being too passive and too conservative. And, and if you do that, somebody is going to kick you, basically, right where it hurts. Um, um, I will leave that slide alone. We're going to program the engineers. So. All right. Uh, I, I, will, I will just briefly mention, the, uh, this comes back to my A-level comment too. Uh, we have too much of mindset in Sri Lanka about what you do in A-level matters for the rest of your life. And it doesn't. Okay, so conclusion. Um, software, to me, the opportunity that software presents to a country like us is massive. It is a, a game where number of people don't matter. Right. The number of software product companies in India, I actually, uh, yesterday I sent a tweet because I was doing some research, I sent a tweet out, tweet out saying, what are, can somebody give me the top 30 Indian software product companies? Right. Uh, several of the responses were like TCS, Wipro, Infosys, no, 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 these are not product companies. Uh, and there's only like in my, from, from all the companies that I got, there's, there's an there's a, uh, organization that has a software product company index. And they, they have valued all the software product companies in India as being valued at about $30 billion. Right? This is a tiny amount in the software industry world. Uh, and, and there are only two companies that I recognize there as having global market presence. But I could be completely wrong, there might be uh, maybe 20 others there. But uh, a, the, the, my point is, uh, the size doesn't matter for this game. 
in the world of software. You can be a small country, you can be a big country, you can be Israel, which I, I can't remember the population of Israel, but it's very small. You can be India, you have much more people, many more people. You can be Sri Lanka, we have far fewer people. Yet you can compete if you come up with ideas that solve problems that people want to pay for, to get a solution for. And that's it. And with software, it's much, much easier to do it. And unlike the time of Ray Vijayawadar, where there was no internet, there was no, it was all about physical innovation. This is intellectual innovation. It's much easier to do it. It's much, it's feasible to reach the world. It was not feasible to reach the world. Right? And one intrinsic advantage we have, I, 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 I have never seen, uh, maybe India has it, but in no other country have I've ever seen, if you go on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, the number of people who go for various kinds of education stuff, right? The, the urge to learn in our population is incredible. That's awesome. Unfortunately, all of them are learning to become accountants, managers, marketeers, or lawyers. <laughs> so that's mostly what those places are teaching, right? Uh, the, a lot of people are doing SEMA, a lot of people are doing, and I'm, again, don't disrespect men at all. We need all of those people. But uh, Sri Lanka, I think, claims we have the largest number of accountants after UK. Largest number, okay? More than India is what we claim to have. I'm sorry, but that's crazy. It's not largest percentage, guys. It's the largest number we claim to have. Uh, that's crazy. It's, that's not what we need, right? We, we, uh, we, need to, we need to solve problems. And if you're being an accountant, great. Solve problems with the accountancy. Don't just stop at working for somebody else, right? We need to solve problems and create opportunity and challenge the world with that stuff. So one other last uh, parting comment. I, I, I make commentary about politics regularly and I get into trouble regularly. So uh, um, uh, software, it's interesting what software means going forward. Uh, I know so many uh, government people use Gmail as their mail, right, or Yahoo Mail or whatever. What that means is US intelligence and uh, British intelligence and Indian intelligence, they all Indian, I don't know, but at least US is reading your mail, right? Uh, maybe it doesn't matter right now because, you know, we are a tiny country, blah, blah, blah. But uh, if you remember during the last war, uh, we had severe restrictions on where we could get weapons from because to buy a weapon meant you had to bend over to the conditions they gave you, right? You had to subscribe to whatever the rules and regulations of their system was and saying, well, if you want this, you got to do that. And that was a big problem for us. And we had only a few countries that really helped us, Pakistan and China being the two notable exceptions and during that tough time for Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, that's the way the game is played, right? That, that's okay. That's the way the game is played. You don't have it, tough shit. You know, why don't you make it yourself? If you need me to give it to you, you need to play by my conditions. Software, if we are dependent purely on international software, it's a huge, huge national risk. Because next time we have that problem, you can just be cut off and say, so you can just shut the system down. Say, well, I'm sorry, you can't use our software anymore because you're not compliant with our whatever rules you want to call it. So, so this is an inter interesting challenge because we need to be a software creating country. Not only us, actually, everybody needs to be because this applies to every country, not just Sri Lanka. It's, it's a software, just as much as software is eating the world, uh, the, the software is not out of reach of politics. There are so many cases that's going on about uh, US laws being applied to European uh, customers and so forth. Now, Europe is strong enough to tell the US, go to hell, you can't have it. Right? We can't do that. You know, we can do that. If we do that, they'll be like, well, great, then you can't come to the US anymore. Right? And they'll be like, well, that, we can't handle that. So fine, you can have our data. Right? So, so we, we can't play that game. We're too small for that. So we need to think about independence aspects of software as well. All right, uh, uh, so just finally, uh, today we are talking about software at a, at a very basic level of silicon, programming silicon in various forms and doing cool stuff. But the next generation of software is far more scary than this because we are learning how to program genes, right? And make biologically programmable entities and programming at the nanoscale. Uh, you combine all these things together, that's the future of the world. And, and marrying everything, creating, a, a marriage of biology and silicon and nano level infrastructure is, is a deadly combination. And that's the power of software. That's what you need to program. It's not just programming this stuff that we're programming now. And so, so the, the opportunity to be a player in that is still open to everybody because that's the beauty of it. Even, even programming at a genetic level is possible for everyone. The software is available for doing that. And, and you can build on that. And that's what I think that we should focus on a, on a, on a long term basis. So thank you very much. I'm going to leave you with this quote. This is a quote from Steve Jobs that I really like. Because a lot of stuff when you do 
things uh, on a long term basis you never know what's going to work you have to keep on doing stuff so so this you can read this uh, later but primarily it's saying you can't connect the dots looking forward you know you do stuff you don't know which one of this stuff is going to line up to get you to the next step you just keep doing stuff because you trust something you trust your instinct right that's what innovation and that's what research and and creating stuff is all about and and having a long term vision saying we want to create something that is going to challenge the world you don't know whether you can do it you know we started wc2 saying we are going to take over the world of minimum we still haven't done it but we're not giving up you know we have a long way to go yet to get to that point and we will do whatever we need to do to get to that point and and same is true for all the other companies that i went through and so many others that i didn't go through right they all have a vision and it takes a long slow process to get through that and just keep on chugging along and planting seeds as you go along thank you very much Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Sanjeeva Veerapatna delivering this year's Ray Witherwatana Memorial Lecture. Seeing what's wrong with the world, seeing it as an opportunity, visualizing the solution, and plotting a path towards it with a singleness of purpose, passion, passion, and more passion. And interestingly enough, Dr. Veerawardner spoke of Elon Musk, who everyone here, I'm sure, has heard of. And something that he has said was, people should pursue what they are passionate about, and that will make them happier than pretty much anything else. Unless, of course, you're a lawyer. <laughs> I'm going to have to make this my day job, I think. <laughs> if that's the case because robots are taking over the legal profession ladies and gentlemen as you are aware the ray witwatersrand memorial lecture is hosted by the institution of engineers of sri lanka but it is a collaborative effort with the ray witwatersrand trust and to tell us more about the trust it gives me great pleasure to call upon the chairman of the trust engineer professor malik ranasinghe to speak a few words Good evening, and I, I know it's quite late. Um, I was supposed to introduce the lecture, not at this time. So basically, the, the objective of this trust is to try and promote what was passionate, what was close to Ray's heart. Basically, we focus on innovations. We try and give a hand to people who are innovative, and you would have noticed all of you who came here this year and before. Our lectures focus on innovation. and there's no better example today than the lecture lecture we had thank you very much sanjeev on behalf of the trust for coming up and telling us things and sanjeev to me i believe is the ray of our generation if ray was born today he would not have been making a land master but he would have been dabbling in the computer thank you very much The Institution of Engineers would like to present a memento in appreciation of the wonderful and inspiring words that Dr. Veerawardena has shared with us today. Let me now call upon the President of the Institution of Engineers, Engineer Jaya Vilal Meghoda, so if you could kindly come forward and let us now, ladies and gentlemen, give a warm round of applause to our speaker this evening, Dr. Sanjeev Veerawardena. With that we come to the conclusion of this evening's proceedings ladies and gentlemen let me first and foremost thank you for braving the weather and making it a point to be here this evening i'm sure that you do not regret being here and i'm sure that what you have heard this evening will uh, will resound in your memory for many years to come uh, on behalf of the trust i would like to thank the speaker Dr. Sanjeev Veerawardena thank you for being here and 
I, I, I don't mind repeating myself, but what you did say was inspiring and enlightening all together. So thank you so much for that. I would, we would also like, the Trust would also like to thank, thank the Institution of Engineers of Sri Lanka for always collaborating and supporting the Trust in this endeavor. And of course, the print media sponsors, uh, the Daily Mirror, Financial Times, Sunday Times and Lanka Deepa and the electronic media sponsor Art TV. With that, we come to the conclusion of this evening's proceedings. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. But before you go, just one more thing from the ever famous Elon Musk. When something is important enough, you do it even if the odds are not in your favor. So find that problem, visualize the solution, and go for it no matter what the odds. Have a pleasant evening. Good night.